Hey, folks. So, now that we spent the last couple of weeks talking about Markov chains, and we finished analyzing and looking at, at absorbing Markov chains and such, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about how you can incorporate these type of environments where you have uh, stochastic state changes into uh, our decision processes like we were doing with dynamic programming. And this is called a Markov decision process, understandably, right? You have a decision you have to make, but there's also these Markov properties as far as we're going to different states. So to start with, I'm going to do actually a slightly different version, which you'll see is not even really a Markov process. It just has a little bit of randomness. And then we see that it's very easily handled in the Bellman equation. So first, a quick reminder of the Bellman equation, which is that V of X has to be equal to the max the best action in our action set, given that, uh, you know, with the immediate value, given our state and our action, plus some beta times the value we get once we've transitioned to a new state. All right? And that was what we had, right? You get some immediate value and you get some future value. Um, given that you're optimizing, given the new state that you're in, this is the transition function, given the action and your current state, you're in some new state, calculate the value of that, discount that possibly, and then add on the, the value you get immediately, and then pick the action that maximizes that, right? So let's turn back to the knapsack problem. And let's suppose that we had something like this, where you have the values for, right? The values. And let's see here, in this example, let me just pull up the numbers here. I actually don't quite have them immediately handy. Give me one second here. They don't really matter too much, but let's see here. I went with um, 0, 20, 10, 30, 20. 0, 20, 10, 30, 20. And what we're going to do is that, first of all, we're going to kind of recast this as far as a uh, the framing as being a set of projects and you need to allocate budget towards them, right? So you have a fixed amount of budget you can spend, you either fund the project or not, and then of course you can't go over budget, all right? Now, in this problem, what we're gonna do is we're going to have two sets of values. So here's values one, and then we'll also have values two. All right, and the values too, and I'll explain what these are in just a moment. Let's, they're going to be higher in this case. So let's hear 80, 40, 50, 80, 40, 50. Once again, the, the numbers actually don't really matter here. I think this is what I went with. And then finally, we have the costs to them. And I'll explain once again why there are two sets of values in a moment. All right, and the cost of budget uh, to fund them. Okay, we're just going five, four, three, two, one here. One, and the budget is six. All right, so you got six budget to allocate. These guys, you know, you can do these three, you can do these two, you can do these two, All right? And, um, but the idea is that, you know, these are on certain projects. So the thing is that although you can fund them, you don't know how much they're actually going to pay off. Perhaps it'll only pay off, there's a 50% chance this one will pay off zero or pay off 80. It could be a lot or a little, right? This one's more certain. It's pretty much, it's, it's a guaranteed third. All right, that's the idea. So this is an uncertainty in how much these things will actually pay off if you fund them. Now, this turns out to be a very straightforward problem, although you could make it a little bit more complicated if you wanted. All right. And... The way you do is you just think about it. Okay, you got to make a decision. Do you want to add this guy? Yes or no? If you do, then you flip a coin and either comes up zero or it comes up 80. And that's how much value you get. Now, if we want to try to figure out how to optimally behave here, we have to decide what we're trying to optimize. All right. Now, the simplest one, which is what we're going to go with initially, is I want to uh, maximize the value I get in expectation on average, right? And do that, all that we have to do is switch it from being a maximizing uh, 
just the immediate value plus the future value to instead being where what happens is that all the value we actually get in any given period or given action is the expect is the expectation of it right the expectation of our immediate value and that's all we got to do it's actually incredibly easy because now this value it's maximizing the total expected value that we're going to be getting so it's that straightforward, right? So what we do is that we look at this and if we say that each one of these have 50-50 chance of paying off each, we just find the expected values. I'm, I you know this problem is so simple, I'm not even gonna be doing it on the board because you'll see it just reduces to a simple knapsack. The expected value of this is just gonna be 40, 30, uh, 30, 30, and, uh, 50. All right, so given these expected values, we were just taking the averages and the costs, you just now have a straightforward basic knapsack that you got to solve. And that's it. Now, if you would try to do something a little bit more complicated, like saying instead of wanting to maximize the expected value, something like you want to maximize the probability that you get at least, I don't know, say 150. Right. If it was something like that, well, now you might, or maybe we should do a more attainable goal, maybe like 120, like 100, 120, somewhere in there. If you want to maximize that probability, you have to do things a little bit differently. It turns out that it's not so trivial to do. I'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, first, I'm going to switch it up and solve the more complicated version of this with stochastic Bellman equation, um, where we instead of having the values be uncertain, you have the costs be uncertain. And that should be an interesting one, all right? So we'll, we'll go into that. All right. So we get rid of this guy here, and we're gonna get rid of the values here, and we're gonna switch around our costs and values here. All right, so just give me one second here. Let's write up the new values and costs. So instead, let's see here. Let's suppose we have values. Oh, let's just stick with the expected values that we had. Maybe I should use those. So we have the 40, 30, 30, 30, and 50, right? So we're still doing the expected values, right? I'm just going to just reduce that down to a single set of values. Just ignore the fact that we're even flipping a coin that's uncertain. Assume we're trying to maximize the expected value under that assumption. Here are the effective values or the expected values for each project. And the costs, meanwhile, are going to be, now we have costs, let's say we'll call this cost two, and then we have costs one, which are equal to one, two, three, four, five. All right, and I think we'll probably up the budget to, let's up it to 10, all right? So now let's consider this problem. This one's an interesting one. This one's a lot more complicated. So to see it, let's first walk through kind of how you would actually, even just like as a human, try to understand this problem. Now, first of all, we're going to go under the assumption that the projects come at you one at a time. This is project one, two, three, four, five. You always have to decide when it comes up, do I want to fund it or not? right and then you you give you set aside the funding for it and that's it right and you fund it and then you see how much it ends up costing and then you move on to the next project so this is some sequential projects all right so this does matter because if you actually had a choice where you could go in different order well first i want to see about this one and then i want to decide on this one and this one and this one then it's a little bit of a harder problem you can still solve it it's just not necessarily trivial so to go through how to do it, I got a little coin here. And let's show you what happened. So the first project comes up as a value of 40. And its cost is either one or five, 50-50 chance. And we have 10 budget. So uh, the first constraint is that uh, we can't fund it unless we have enough to fund it in either case, right? So if we only had, say, three, three budget left, we'd have to pass on it because we didn't have costing five, we'd go bankrupt and we can't have that. So 
we have this one. Let's suppose we look at it and say, eh, sure, I'll try going for it, right? So now we're going to flip the coin. If it comes up heads, we'll say that it's uh, cost one. If it's tails, it'll be cost two, all right? So I decided to fund it. I flipped my coin, and it came up tails. So that means that we now get our 40, all right? So uh, we did yes, and then we get our 40 in value. But the cost here turned out to be five because we, we flipped tails, all right? So now what do we have left? Now we only have five, five budget left, right? Oh dear, all right? So now we come to this one and we say, do we wanna try funding it? Let's go for it, right? So yeah, we're gonna fund it. So we're gonna get an extra 30 with our five budget left. We flipped the coin and it came up tails again, brutal. Right, so now we're going to get a total of, we're going to get an extra 30, but then the cost here turned out to be four. All right, so now we only have one budget left. We got these three items. We can't afford any of them. We're done. We get 70 in all. All right, that's it. Let's do it again. So now we repeat the process. Just, oh, and so we end up going with yes. In this scenario, we went yes, yes, no, no, no. Right, and this is what we got 70 and we used up nine in our cost uh, of, our, of our budget. All right, now let's suppose we did it again. Right, all right, we choose yes again. We flip our coin. Uh, I don't know if it, all right, it actually did come up heads. I was going to lie to you and said it came up heads even either way, but it did. It really did. Now that I've shot my credibility, right? So now we've gotten our 40 in value. We chose yes here, and our cost so far has only been one, so we still have nine budget left over, all right? Cool. So do we try uh, funding the second one? No, nah, let's just skip it, all right? So then we just choose no here. And on the third one, let's do it. I'm not even going to flip it. We for sure get 30 there, and it for sure costs us the three. So now we have six budget left over. Um, let's try out this one just in hopes that if it, oh, um, that's unfortunate, huh? Maybe we shouldn't have uh, done that because now if you look at it, we can only get one of these, right? Even in the best case scenario where this thing comes up two, we'll only have, uh, four left over. So we wouldn't be able to do this one. So we kind of already boxed ourselves into a corner. Once we said yes there, this one will have to be a no. Uh, well, I mean, it doesn't have to be, we can do it. But if we're only if but if we can only fit one of these two in here, you know, we either take this one and we can't get this one, or we pass on this one and we take this one. This one has the fifty. So we get the fifty, and then let's flip our coin just to see how much it um how much it will actually cost us. And it came up heads again. Once again, legitimately, even though I wanted to. Oh no, I actually want to come up tails. Oh well, it came up heads, so therefore it cost us five. And we used up nine budget, and we got a total of, in this case, 120. If it had come up tails, then we would have had five budget remaining rather than just one, and we would have had 120 in value. And then we'd look at this and go, ah, darn, if we hadn't passed on one of those, maybe we would have been okay, right? Except that, of course, we didn't know that we would have this budget. And in fact, if we had used it up, we couldn't have risked going over budget there, so we wouldn't have taken that one anyway. But, you know, if it was a different order, we might have been able to pull it off, all right? So anyway, so you can see kind of the problem that comes into this, which is that, first of all, it's not easy to come up with a strategy, but also unlike the other one where there was some optimal policy, yes, yes, no, no, yes. Here, we don't have an optimal policy, not, a strict, not, not just a straight linear one. Because what we do, we have to decide what's best given what has happened. Because sometimes it might be the case that when we include the first item, it costs us five, and then we only have five budget to work with for the remainder for remaining four items. Or it could come up only cost us one, at which point we have extra budget and we're gonna change around our decision. So our decisions isn't just, just a single value here, but instead a whole set, a whole slew of different things 
based on what ends up happening with the flipping of the coins whenever we add one in. All right, we have a strategy that branches off into multiple directions, but there is still one optimal choice at every given step. All right, and that's something that we're going to be trying to solve. All right, so how do we do this? Well, what we need to do now is acknowledge that when we make our decision, when we're in our given state and we make a decision, this transition function used to just say, okay, you transition to this new state. Now it has to say you can transition to one of many states and it has to list those different states. All right, that's the key. So the transition function of x comma a now gives, now gives a distribution of states that you can go to, states, right? Rather than just a single state that you go to, it's not a straightforward function, now has to give a whole set of them, a distribution. And what we want to do, since we want to maximize the expected value, what we got to do is we're going to have to put an expected value around this thing as well. All right. And to do that, how do we actually calculate that expected value? Well, assuming that there is a, uh, a, an integer number of possible states that we can go to, in this case, only two possible states, either the one where it costs us uh, five and the other one, or the one where it costs us one, or you know, cost one or cost two. So what we have to do is you have to say, first, we still want to maximize the best action. Right, And then we want the expected value of the immediate value, which in this case, it was just the expected value. So that was very trivial, right? But we'll still include that in there just for effect and completeness. Plus, now what's the expected value of this? Well, it's gonna be beta times, and now the expected value, future value we get will have to be a sum over, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, letter x prime to denote the next state that we're in. And x prime has to be now a member of e of x comma a. All right. So let me move this summation over a little bit over the middle of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at every possible state we can go to from our a uh, set of possible transitions, right? So in this case, it can be either it costs, it uses up cost one or cost two, whichever one of the two costs. So out of these possible states that we go to, and to get the expected value, we have to say, what's the probability of going to that state given our current state and the action we chose times, you know, so it's the, it's the value we get, the, the probability that we actually get this state times the value we get given that we go to that state, All right? And that's it, All right? So we can go to either the state where it uses a five of our budget, right? And we have to say, okay, what's the value? What's the, our optimal value if we end up going to the state where it costs us five and we only have five budget left with the remaining four items? And then times that 50% chance that that happens, right? Because if we add it, there's a 50% chance that it ends up costing us five, for this first item plus uh, the probability that instead it only costs one times the value we get if it, gets, if it only costs us one, right? So in all, we're going to get the expected value based on uh, the, the sum of all the different states and their probability of occurring, right? And we have to sum up all, those, uh, all the values for those. And that's what we now want to maximize, all right? Not trivial, but we can do it, all right? So let's go on to the computer and let's actually code this up for this problem, all right? And you'll see that there actually isn't that much we gotta change, all right? The from compared to our original math stack. So now we're back onto the computer. Let me just double check here, good. All right. And let us try solving this. What we do here is 
go. So first, let's write up the problem here. We have n equals 5 items. We have the values I said were 40, 30, 30, 30, 50. The cost, 1, was just, um, let's see here, I think it was 5. Uh, I think I said 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then cost 2 were 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Right? Simple enough. And then our budget was 10. Cool. All right. Now, what we should do is we got to define what our state is and things like that. And I'm going to be using the name tuples, which we hopefully have used in class. I can't guarantee that because I haven't actually taught the classes yet. But I believe that we will have used name tuple by now, right? So we can import name tuple and we'll define a couple. So let's see here. So we have first our state. We'll define a, a state uh, type, which will be a name tuple, which we'll call knapsack state. Or just state, I guess is fine. And then it will have both an index and a budget. And usually I'd say like number of items remaining, but let's just keep it simple because that was always so confusing doing the minus number of items remaining and stuff and remaining. Uh, we all know the sub problem is if we start on index one, the sub problem is the remaining ind indices, right? So we just march from index zero, one, two, three, four, and then we're done. All right. And so our state has to be our budget and which index, what, what project we're currently looking at, right? And then we have a transition, which is a name tuple, transition. And this one now, for each one of our transitions, before it was just what state you go to, right? Which would be like next state. But what we're also going to have to include now with each transition is going to be the probability of that transition. So now this is going to be, okay, there's a 50% chance that our next state uses only one of our budget, and there's a 50% chance that it uses up five of our budget, right? So this will make things a little bit easier. And then finally, we can have a result, which is a name tuple, result, and this one should be what's getting output, which should include both the, uh, the 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 action or the policy and the expected value which i'll just call value all right but it's going to be the expected value in this case so now that we have those little name tuples all set up that way we can always we can easily write some of our code we just need to write up the, our functions for the possible actions the transitions the immediate value and then the actual core recursion all right so possible actions of state should be pretty straightforward here, right? Now we have to be careful. We have to have enough um, budget to cover the worst case cost, don't forget, right? So we have max cost is just equal to uh, the maximum of cost one of state dot index, right? So if we're looking at, if our current index is zero, then we have to look at which one's the max of these two. So it's going to be max of cost one and cost two of state dot index, right? Looks good. And then if our budget is less than the max cost, then our only action is to not accept it, right? So we just have to return a no. And then otherwise, we return that you can you can choose not to include it or include it, right? If we have enough budget, straightforward enough. I think. Now let's go on to the next one. Let's get the immediate value. This one should be nice and easy. Of state comma action. And we'll do that. All right. So if um, action is equal to no, then what do we get? We just return zero. Otherwise, we can return the uh, values of um, 
just looking at this really fast. All right, yeah. Uh, values of state.index, right? So just return the value. Now remember, right here, if we had had two possible um, um, values, if we had values one and values two, like we had originally before we smushed them down into the expected value, all that we do right here is that you get zero or you get whatever the probability is, you know, 50% chance of values one of state index plus 0.5 times uh, values uh, values two of state index, right? That's all. That's the only place where we would change. Otherwise, everything else would have been the standard knapsack that we had done back in, you know, week three or whatever it was. All right. So easy. Now then, transition function is going to be a little bit more complicated, right? Transitions of state and action. We got to figure out this now then. Push, push, wait, why do I keep getting messed up now? Oh, it does add that automatically. Okay, that's why. All right. So, um, so let's go back and try to do this. So in this case, our transitions are going to always be either we use up uh, budget uh, uh, cost one of the budget or that we uh, use cost two. But it depends on our action, of course, right? If action, the easiest one is first, if our action is no, that we don't do it, then what we have to do is we have to return a, uh, a transition, right? Which I'll, I'll get to in a moment. Let's actually skip the no one for just one second and I'll come back to it. Uh, so what we need to do is that if we do answer yes, because this one, by the way, it is very straightforward because clearly our transition is just, we have uh, uh, the same budget and one, and we are in our index increments by one. But we'll see that you have to be a little bit careful with it because once we describe how we actually put this one together, you'll see it's not going to be quite so easy, right? So now what we're supposed to return, first of all, it's just like with possible actions, we want to return a set of all the possible transitions. So it has to be a list in this case, right? So we need to return a list. And in that list, there are two possible uh, next states. The first one, is that the next state, let's just quickly write it up here, right? It will be state with an index, which is the current index plus one. And then the state dot budget, we have the current budget minus cost one of state dot index, All right? So this is saying, okay, one possible state we go to is the one where we just increment index by one, and then we our budget goes down by the the first cost, right? And the other one is going to be state of state dot index plus one, state dot budget minus cost two of state dot index, right? So those are the two states we can go to, but that's not enough information. And this is why we have this extra name tuple up here. Why I did it, right? Because we don't just because we're not going to just need v of the next state we don't just need x prime we also need to know the probability of going into that state right we can't forget that that's going to be a key part because we have to weight it by that amount because well in this case it's just 50 50 and they get equal weighting it could be that there's an 80 percent chance that we get cost two and a 20 percent chance we get cost one so we have to include those probabilities here all right so here what we do is we have to say that we actually want to transition where the probability is 0 0.5, and then that's the state we go to. And then here's a transition with probability 0 0.5, and here's the state we go to. And so that's what it looks like. Here, let me expand this out just a smidge for us here. There we go. All right. So now, ooh, missed it by just a smidge. There we go. All right. So now, as you can see, we have uh, we have two different possible transitions, each with fifty percent chance that we go to this either the state where we uh, lose one, where we lose cost one, or we lose cost two in budget. All right. Now, and over here, uh, what do we return here? Right. So it has to be a list, and also it has to be a transition, right? Because we're not going to return different. Because we typically, if we can, we want to return the exact same. Uh, type structure. We don't want to have to do some if statement like, okay, is this a transition? If it is, then wait by the probability. If not, blah, blah, blah. 
the easiest thing to do is just say, there's only one thing we go to, and it's with a 100% chance that we go to the state where we have state.index plus one and state.budget stays the same, right? The same budget. And there's a 100% chance we transition into that. So this is how we can write up our now our set of possible transitions with both the probability and what state we end up going to. All right. So now we got to have our lookup here. Right. So lookup equals some empty dictionary here. All right, which will contain our state and our um yeah, which will just contain our state, I believe. We'll see. We'll see. It should be interesting. Yeah. Should just be our state. So let's take a look at this. So knapsack of state. All right, so this is what we're uh, what we've been doing. So first thing we gotta check is if it's a base case. And in this case now, rather than being that there's zero or fewer remaining items, now it's going to be if the uh, index is greater than or equal to n. Because in this case, it's okay zero. The when our index is zero, we're looking at the first item. One, we're looking at second. Two, we're looking at third. Three, we're looking at four. And then if uh, on four, we're looking at the fifth and last item, right? Since there's five items, right? When the index is four, we're looking at the last. So now, if our uh, state dot index is five or higher, we know we've gone past the last element and we're done looking at items. And in that case, we just return a uh, a result, which has to be a um, has to have an action and a value, right? Action and value, so we'll just return zero. All right, it's an empty action, zero and value, all right? Straightforward. And then we can do once again, if the state is not in the lookup, then we're gonna have to calculate it. And once we calculate it, we can now say uh, return lookup of state, right? So now we just gotta calculate uh, what the um, what should go into the state, right? Into lookup. So we get first our immediate value, and then we have the future value, right? So we can say um, the the value associated with the action. Oh, well, let's see here. How are we going to do this? I think we should go through a for loop over all the actions, right? So we got to loop over all the actions, right? Because we want to maximize our overall the possible pick the action with the highest value, right? So let's do a for loop. Well, so for action and possible actions of state, right? And we'll talk about how we actually get the maximum in just a moment, right? In the in the previous code, let me try to pull it up here, uh, in case you've forgotten. This is what it looked like where we had this nice thing down here where all we did we said the optimal value was equal to the maximum over uh, all the possible actions. So for action and possible actions, we just said, what's the maximum uh, of the immediate value plus the future value, right? Unfortunately, we're gonna, the code is gonna be a little bit more complicated because we gotta do this extra uh, sum over the expected value of the different transitions and stuff. So I'm gonna switch it to being a for loop on the outside and then We'll just keep track of the max as we do it. So let's go back to this. So for each one of the actions, what we got to do is calculate how much it's worth, right? So we have to say, OK, the uh, action value is first things first. It's equal to the immediate value of the state in the action, right? That's straightforward. And then we have to add on the future value, all right? So now it's going to be action value plus equals. We're going to add on to it a, um, we're going to have to do the summation, where we're going to have to do the sum over all the different possible transitions, right? So we'll say for uh, tran and uh, transitions of state comma action. All right, so first we're going to do a for loop over all of our transitions. All right, that's, um, eh, I don't like that. sorry, there we go. 
All right, so we have to sum over all the different transitions. And what we're going to have to take is first the trans.prob times, right? So therefore, that's the probability of it. I believe I just called it uh, prob, yeah. And we have to take the next state and calculate the value of that, right? So it's knapsack of transition dot next state, right? But we have to be a little bit careful there uh, because remember the knapsack is going to function returns a result, ideally, ideally. We'll get to that in a moment. But yeah, it returns a result. And so we need to get the value out of it, not the action. We aren't interested in the optimal action in the future. We just care about the optimal value in the future. So that's why here we have it. It looks pretty nice here. It's not that bad. Let's take a look at this just to make sure it all makes intuitive sense to us. So the action value is, first of all, e for this action, it's just equal to the immediate value. And then we have to add on where we have to sum over all the different possible transitions given this state and action. And for each one of those transitions, we have to take the probability of that transition occurring and multiply it by the future value given the new state we go to, all right? That seems to look pretty good to me, all right? There it is in two lines, just to make it a little bit clear. So now that we have the action value, we're going to need to get uh, the best one out of all of it, right? The best action and action value pair, all right? So how do we do that? So one way to do it very simply, is to you know we're going to be looping through it and we need to keep track of the best one because unfortunately you know what we would want to do is um i mean we could in theory do it a um like we could put this in a function for example to get the action value um yeah let's do that there's a few like i said there's several ways that we can code this you can do it however you want but let's just add it right here we can say uh def expect future value of state and action. There we go. And then we can paste this right in here. Where the action value is the immediate value of the state and action. And then, uh, uh, oh no, this isn't expected future value. This is just expected action value, we'll call it, right? And we add on all the expected future value there, right? And then we can return action value, right? So now all I've done is just taken all that put into a little function here. And now what we have is in theory here, we can just say uh, result equals the maximum. Here, sorry. All right, so this makes it nice and simple where we can start using this thing again. Um, uh, well, we're still in a little bit of trouble here, but that's okay. We'll survive. Um, let me think on this, actually. I was hoping this would make it nice and simple. But unfortunately, we still have to keep track of the best action, too. So it's a little bit of a pain. That's okay. Let's do it. So what we can do is that we can just say this, something like this. Um, possible actions is equal to, I'm just making this up on the fly at this point, but that's okay. So first we get our possible actions, right? And then for each one, we have to get the um, the value associated with it, right? And so maybe I'll do it actions possible, actions values, which is just gonna be equal to the expected action value of state comma action for action and actions possible. So for each one of the actions, let's just quickly calculate what its expected value is right there. And then what we need to do is get the uh, best action. Now I believe in NumPy, there is an easy way when you have two lists to get the maximum and then the corresponding, like the maximum, the index that maximizes it. Um, in this case, what we'll do is we'll have to, we'll just use zip here. You can zip up the actions possible and the action values, vals. 
And then what we can do is that we can say max of that thing. And then let me think here with max, there's the, um, you use the key function. Lambda, uh, max comma v. I forget, there, there's some easy way to maximize on the second element. We also just maximize on the first element. Um, that might be the way to go. It doesn't really matter. Like I said, there's a million ways that you can do this. Let's do it this way. Let's, uh, I believe this will do it. We'll have to quickly test it to make sure that it's working real fast. So if we take the max of that, and then we can say, um, best val, best uh, action is equal to that. And then I believe we can just say, uh, lookup of state is equal to a result with the best action, best value. So I know that, you know, this code might be a little bit confusing, but it's not that hard. Let me show you on the, on Python here. Let me just go into Python. So in here, let's suppose that we have just as an example here, we'll say a is equal to one, two, three, four, uh, let's do one, five, three, two, one, or four, or something like that, right? And then B is equal to, let's say, A, B, C, D, E, right? This is effectively what we have, right? Where we have some list of values, and then we have a list of uh, our actions, right? Yes or no's. And what we want to pick out is we want to get 5B out of this, right? So what we really need to know is, okay, out of these possible actions, which index has the highest odds right here is the five here. So now what we do is we pair up the five, you know, it's the second, it's, it's element one, zero, one, index one. And then what we want to return is, okay, give me the value five and then also the action B. And the way I'm doing that is zip, in case you're not aware of it. If you zip up A and B, what it looks, what it does is it just pairs everything up, right? So 1A, 5B, 3C, 2D, 4E, right? And now that you have this, what you can do is you should be able to just take the max of it. And I believe max by default will maximize over the first element. So we'll choose to first see which one of these is the biggest out of these five numbers, all right? Which is what we're interested in. So when you grab max, you now get the five and the B out. And so all I did was I just maximized over all of them and then stored that as the best value and the best action, right? So now the best value is the five and the best action would be B in this case. And then I just made that into a result and stored that in the lookup. And now we should be good to go, all right? So now let's actually first, we'll try uh, printing it out here. So we'll print out uh, cost one, just to remind ourselves, cost one. Uh, F that thing, and then we can plug in cost one, and then we can do that for two, and we can change this for values. Values, and then we also have the budget, don't forget. So now we have uh, budget. Budget. Now we print all those out. Now what we'll do is we'll just print out. Now uh, we'll, we'll give us an initial state here. It's just, we have, we start off with the first index, index zero, and our budget is just equal to the budget. All right. So that's our initial state. And then we can print out the optimal by just saying print out uh, optimal, uh, we'll just say optimal, whatever, doesn't matter, right? And then um, we'll spit out knapsack of the initial state, All right? And hopefully that'll work. I'm not sure, maybe I should actually, um, let me actually, Uh, put that into its own line. Optimal equals delete surrounding that guy. 
All right, and so now we'll just put in the optimal. All right, now this is not going to be that exciting, but let's quickly run it and take a look. Uh, oh, I need to actually go into the projects, computational economics, and now we can say Python, um, what do we call this, stochastic knapsack? Let's see it run. So it does run. And what it says is that our first action, uh, that does not look right, does it? I'm going to take a look at this. 90 plus 90 is 180, right? So it seems difficult for it to expect to get 180. I must have made a small mistake here, right? So let me quickly take a look at it here. Our budget is 10. That's fine. I must have made a terrible error in uh, some place here. Uh, let's see here. State.index, if the action's no. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. I must have made a mistake. If action is no, return zero. Um, hmm. That's an interesting one, ain't it? If budget. Oh, um, that's not right. Of course, budget will never be over. What we need is state.budget. Whoops. Man, you know, when you're doing this live, I mean, well, you know, effectively, I'm doing it one take, you know, and so, like, you know, hopefully you don't, uh, you can find your bug quickly. All right, there we go. We found it. Now we know that, yes, we do include the first item, but the expected value is 107.5, right? And now this isn't that useful. It's like, okay, so you include the first item, but do you include the second? Well, I bet you it depends on what you flip, right? It could be that you off in one direction or the other. So to see this, Let's try actually printing out the lookup table, right? And we'll see what ends up, what this looks like. Whoa, that's a mess. Let's uh, let's do it in a for loop here. For uh, uh, state and uh, for state comma uh, result and oh boy, lookup dot. What is this? Not keys. I don't know. Let me let me just try doing that real fast. State res. Does it even work? It might not work as it currently stands. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Thank goodness. Dot items. That's what I was trying to remember. Thankfully, it tells me. There we go. There we go. Now we can read this. So we start off at the bottom here. Oh, uh. You guys can't see that possibly. Let me move it over. There we go. I'm starting to learn that there's a there's a big block here in the video. <laughs> All right. So over here, let's see here. So in the very bottom case, when we're on the first item with our full budget, we choose um, we are going to choose to include the first item, and we're expecting it 107.5 in value. All right. Now, if it turns out that we get bad luck. And it costs us five, so that means that now we're we, we are on index one, and our budget is only five left. Then we're going to choose not to include the second item, and we're going to get. And now we're, our expected value is only fifty. It's gone down tremendously, right? Which is not that big a surprise. Part, 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 partly it goes down just because we get an immediate forty in value, right? Forty of this value is from the first item. So what it's saying is that in the future we expect sixty-seven and a half in value, right? If we end up getting bad luck, we only get 50. Meanwhile, over here, uh, this can't be, oh yeah, no, no, that's right. This is if we choose not to include it, right? Because we still have 10 in budget, but right here we should have, somewhere in here, let's quickly find it. Index equals one, budget equals nine, there it is, All right? So this is if we get lucky, if we include it and it only costs us one, then we're actually going to include the second value, right? And we're going to get 85 in value and expectation. We get the 30 from that one plus an extra 55 in expectation. So you can see right here, it's not a surprise. This, sh this should have added up where what we're getting is we get, when we include this first item, we guarantee 40, that's baked in. And there's a 50-50 chance between us getting 50 in the future and 85 in the future, all right? And so when you average those out, that's going to be 135, cut that in half. Sure enough, that's 67 and a half. And that's where the other 67 and a half is coming from here. 
right, based on the 50-50 chance there. Now, if we choose not to include it, this first item, we see that in the future, we have, we're now at index one, budget 10, and we're going to only in expectation get 95, which is why we opted to, instead of taking zero plus 95, we're gonna take the 40 plus a 50-50 chance at 50 or 85. That's what we decided to do. That's what's optimal, all right? And you can go through it, you know, this whole thing, of course, goes through every single branching possibility and figures out what to do. It's pretty cool, if you ask me. I think that's really cool, what it's doing. Now, it's not necessarily easy to read this and understand it. So there's a lot of different ways that you can try to output these, because once again, there's not just one strategy. There's actually a lot of strategies in here uh, baked into this. Um, whoa, what on earth is it doing there? Let me just try running again. There we go. Um, there's a lot of different strategies here, right? It depends on what ends up happening with the coin flip. So one thing that you can do if you want is to run Monte Carlo simulations and print out some Monte Carlo sims, all right? So to do that, it's easy enough. What we do is we just say, um, we can say, okay, we'll start off with our initial state, right? So state equals init state. And then we can say for blank in n, because we're going to be running for the n. Uh, oh, I got to do range of n, right? Because we need to do it for each one of the indices. What we're going to do is we're just going to run forward. And the way we do that is we say the result equals knapsack of the state. So remember, this is going to spit out when we call knapsack of our initial state. It's going to say, okay, this is your decision and this is your expected value, right? That's what it's going to say. So we get our decision, our expected value, and we'll print that out, print out our current state and whatever the result was. And then we have to get our next state. Now, what is our next state? Well, what we do is we grab out of all the transitions of um so here's our uh what i'd say here sorry Res dot action there we go so the first thing that we do is we say okay given our current state and what the result says that we should do what our optimal action is let's get all the possible transitions and then what we have to do is we're going to have to select one of them right at random now, in general, you want to do the weighted random based on the probabilities, and that's easy enough. There's an, uh, I believe, I believe random.choice lets you specify probabilities, right? But at the very least, uh, if you need it, you can also import NumPy, and NumPy has a random choice where you can specify what the probabilities are, and you have to specify the probability associated with each transition. Luckily here, since it's 50-50, I'm just going to uh, cheat here. And I'll assume that out of the possible transitions, if we say no, there's only one possible transition. And if we say yes, include then there's two possible, they're equally likely. I already, you know, we kind of already know that. So I'm gonna cheat and write this code, even though it's not quite correct. We'll just say random choice out of the different transitions. We choose one of them. And then we have to say what the next state is out of that. Right, so we take the next state out of one of the random transitions, right? So we just choose the one at random, choose that to be our next state, and then we update our state and then repeat this n times. So let's take a look at this real fast. First, I'll run it once and then I'll, I'll run it in a loop so that way it goes faster. And that way we actually get some useful stuff out of it. Um, oh, I should probably not print out the lookup if I'm going to do this. Uh, there we go. So here we start off with zero and five budget, right? So this is actually doing one of the simulations, right? We choose to include it, as we know is optimal. In this case, we got bad luck, and now we only have five left. So then we pass, we pass again, we pass again, and then we include the last one, and it doesn't matter what happens. Let's run it again. Same thing happened. Same thing happened again, same thing happened again. Eventually something else should, should happen. There we go. And you know, that's just, we just, unfortunately we flipped the coin heads five times in a row you know that's on four or six times in a row we flipped heads wait how many times did we flip heads in a row there one two three four five six seven eight times in a row 
And that's a fair coin. That's pretty impressive. Sorry, just side note there. That was like, what, that's one in 256 times we have to do it that often? Anyway, well, you know, technically two out of 256 because it could have kind of tails all eight times. So it's kind of extreme, one in 100. Anyway, uh, here we finally get it. Good luck here. And now we still have nine left. And so what we do is we choose to include the next one. We get good luck again. So we include that one, and that one is guaranteed to take three. And then finally, now we have our choice uh, since we've used up. This is the one I did on the board, actually, where we've now used up uh, six in value in total, right? Six of our budget. And so now we only have four left. And since we know we can't include the last one, we try to include this one right here. We can see what happens if maybe we get a little bit more unlucky. Uh, this one, you can see they got unlucky, but it doesn't matter because they didn't have enough in the last one either way. Uh, let me see if we can get one of the... Uh, this one right here is interesting. So here we got it the first time, then we uh, got unlucky the second, so now we only have five left. And so therefore, we forego the rest and wait until the very last one and go for that. All right? Makes sense. Makes sense. Looks pretty cool. Compared to this one up here where... We opted not to go for everything but the last one. This one, when we get unlucky after the second uh, item, we then hold off and just wait for the last one because we have exactly five budget left. All right. So you can see that our optimal strategy depends on what ends up happening to us. So it's kind of cool to see. You can do this where you can pop this guy into a for loop if we wanted. For blank and range of, say, 20. And then we just run multiple simulations here, right? And then we can just say something like print uh, mc or sim slash n or something like that. Whatever. doesn't really matter. Oh, I probably did that poorly. doesn't matter, right? And now here's 20 simulations if we want, right? We can also do a lot of other things like I've done it where you can actually run a dynamic program to pick out a specific path. Like you can say, okay, which path leads to the highest value, right? And then you 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 print out that path. Which path leads to the lowest value? Print out that path, so that way you know what path that is. It's actually kind of interesting. You have to write one of those codes. I've also written one where the uncertainty was highest, where it's okay between the two choices, what's the variance? And then pick the path that has the highest variance across all the uh, the different nodes. That's a cool one to do. And so you can print out uh, what's the thing that that gets you closest, which path gets you closest to the expected value, things like that. You can do a lot of different. You can rather than just printing out random ones, you can try to print out very specific ones uh, that are somehow interesting to your problem. All right, but in general, this is what happens once you move into the world of stochastic. Uh, of stochastic dynamic programming and, and Markov decision processes. All right. So in class, we'll go over some examples of these. We'll, we'll get you guys practicing. And then uh, next week, we'll start moving into the world of uncertainty and Bayesian inference, which should be a lot of fun. See you then.